Good morning. I'm KBS Krishna. I teach English at Central University of Himachal Pradesh. I would like to thank Dr. Tarun Tapas Mukherjee and Better College for the opportunity to speak uh, speak to you. Today, I'm going to speak on Henry David Thoreau's Well Done. Mm, it's oddly pertinent that we are speaking of well done at a time such as this. Now, why do I say oddly pertinent? One of the reasons why we are saying it's oddly pertinent is because this is a period where most of us have gone into voluntarily, voluntarily accepted social distancing. One. And along with this voluntary social distancing that due to quarantine or lockdown or whatever it is, this is something that Thoreau had practiced more than 170 years ago. Now, Thoreau, of course, had gone far more willingly than most of us had done. But uh, it seems significant that uh, we are reading Thoreau or we are reading Valdem at such a time where we are also forced into similar kind of social distancing and, and isolation or solitude as you, would, as, as you want to think of it. Thoreau's Valden, which describes his experiences when he lived for a period of two years, two months, and two days <laughs> in the woods that belonged to his friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, this is a period that he speaks of in Valden. That's what that's what he's writing about. Now, while it's a period of two years, two months, and two days. Um, Thoreau does not uh, Thoreau does not actually speak uh, speak about this whole two years as if it is two years in his in his book while it's a non-fiction while it's non-fiction while it's a memoir of whatever had happened in the woods what Thoreau does here when he actually writes about this experience something like seven years later when he published it in 1854 one thing that Thoreau does here is congest it, contract it to a period of one year so that in one sense it, it is dramatized. That's all the seasons of, of a year are mentioned in this book. And while um, he speaks about all the seasons that are that, that take place while he is living on this uh, in this neck of woods near the pond, he also speaks about this changing season so that the reader gets an idea of how it is to live for a whole year in the woods with the world changing around him. Thoreau describes the vegetation, the birds, the animals that he uh, comes across and the various experiences that he has while living in the snake of woods. That's one of the things that Thoreau does. But <coughs> this particular experience where he is speaking about this uh, living in the woods is not exactly that of a uh, that of someone who had no right to live alone. Thoreau does not tell us directly in, in Walden that uh, he is indebted to Emerson for allowing him to stay on the neck of in, in, in that particular place that he um, that we term as Walden but the place that he is living in belonged to Emerson and Emerson had permitted him, allowed him to actually stay there. That's one of the things that we have to remember while we read Walden because there's a huge difference between thinking about Thoreau as a squatter. A squatter has no rights. A squatter is someone who has occupied a land and who has done so without the permission of the landowner. A squatter does not pay rent, a squatter does not buy, buy the land, a squatter does not pay taxes, any of these things, and Thoreau does not do any of these things either. But the main difference here is, Thoreau has, uh, gets the permission, has the permission of Emerson, the, the owner of the land to do so, and there's also something like a barter system that goes on where Emerson expects him to um, clean a piece of the land and probably farm it which Thoreau does well, when he builds his log cabin and also does this farming which he describes in Walden. This is in one sense a re um, repayment for whatever Emerson had done for him. However, 
the reason why we keep speaking about how Thoreau is not uh, not exactly a squatter when he is staying in Walden is <coughs> we have to remember that for but for uh, for for Thoreau this staying on the land this staying in this neck of woods is um, akin to the way birds and animals actually stay and um, stay in a jungle or or stay or or in one sense occupy various uh, trees or build their nests on trees is not so much uh, as if they are squatters but it's almost as if they have the permission of the tree to actually build a nest there in the same way Thoreau has gone back to a primeval way of actually taking permission from the landowner not really bothering with certain uh, formalities that become a part of our civilized society now this is just an introduction to what Thoreau does in Walden um, does in the neck of woods and which is described in Walden we are not really going into the whole text we are trying to limit ourselves and trying to limit ourselves to just four chapters the chapters that I'll be dealing with in detail I'll give the reasons why I have chosen these four chapters are one economy two solitude three the village and four baker farm these are the ones that I'm going to look at <coughs> the reason why I want to actually deal with these four chapters one economy the first chapter is the longest it not only gives us a detailed introduction to what Thoreau does but it also provides us a, a deep inside a proper clear understanding of how Thoreau's mind works that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind when we are reading uh, the first chapter and the first chapter becomes essential almost key to understanding Walden as it provides not just this um, a key to understanding Thoreau's mindset but also a key to understanding American society of the time and what was actually happening he describes in detail the village life that was that he actually speaks of in the third chapter that is the, the chapter that we are doing is not the third chapter the third the third one that we look at in, in the village uh, but even in the first in economy he speaks about how people in the American cities, American towns and villages in the 19th century behaved and in one sense they were not behaving all that differently from the way we are uh, we behave right now and not just in, uh, across in, in, in a, not just a different time period but even in a different continent we look at general uh, behavior patterns and we see something similar so the first chapter in one sense makes us also realize how relevant Walden is to the present time. The second part that I want to speak about is solitude, which um, gives us an insight, um, not just as, as economy has done into Thoreau's thinking, but our idea of why uh, solitude, all this social experiment that Thoreau take, uh, is uh, comes up with is important not just for him but the social experiment that that he comes up with by of, of um, moving away from society of staying in this isolation and solitude how, how is it useful and what exactly do we mean by solitude our understanding of the term the village of course uh, as we said speaks about his experiences with the nearby village for one thing but along with speaking about the village folk that he the villages that he meets on a regular basis it also is extremely crucial for us because he speaks about an incident here which he speaks about in greater detail in civil disobedience and his understanding of government and how, what are the kind of rules and laws that we need in a civilized society these are the things that Thoreau speaks about in the village which uh, while he does not go into detail here as he does in civil disobedience you can see that uh, even Thoreau when he is referring to the test well in this in this particular chapter you can see where uh, this particular idea was born while he was at Walden and fourthly Baker Farm which shows to us why Thoreau's experiment is frowned upon by quite a, 
quite a lot of people for one thing and secondly the the problems that critics have with thorough firstly and along with having this problem with thorough it also shows how difficult it is to do what thorough has done the difficulties i mean the problems with trying to emulate thorough now <coughs> starting with our first chapter let us um, first look at what this economy is economy remember mm, is when we speak of economy the first thing that we are struck by is why is someone who is leading a hermit's life a hermit's existence such as thoreau is in this neck of woods speaking of economy that's the first question that we are start think uh, that we are struck by why are we actually bothered by this why why are we uh, why are we even you know, why is he even talking about money or economy but remember one of the things that thoreau is doing here when he titles it economy is that he is doing it willing uh, willfully and that's what i feel that he is doing he starts not by speaking about money matters rather he speaks about tradition he speaks about the kind of world that he is that he belongs to the kind of problems that he is seeing one of the things that thoreau says right right at the very beginning of weld and in 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 this chapter is that uh in my 30 years of life so far and he is around 30 by the time he is writing this i had never been given as one sensible piece of advice so far now we might believe it we might accept it we might agree with him we might not agree with him but what thoreau is basically saying here is that uh the world do not really have anything pertinent to say anything significant to say those who are older than you say in other words is also going against tradition he is speaking about a certain kind of independence from the worlds that that we belong to from the kind of ideas that have been projected that idea seems familiar right the spread is similar to what emerson speaks of when he is speaking about man thinking and man challenging the kind of ideas that have been pa- passed on across over generations in a similar fashion thoreau is also saying that we need to move away from um, <coughs> the kind of ideas the kind of advices that people have given us already it is pertinent here to remember that when thoreau had actually um, gone into um, gone to this wood cabin to live away from society had does so on july the 4th now july the 4th that does ring a bell right when we think of july the 4th in america in 1776 um on july the 4th the declaration of independence was signed of course it was supposed to be signed on july the 2nd but it came about only on july the 4th and while the whole nation was celebrating american independence in 1845 some 70 years later thoreau was not really interested in celebrating it in the same way that others were but rather had declared his own independence and this independence is where he has moved away from society moved in, into this neck of woods moved into this um, uh, moved to live a life of solitude now while he is living this life of solitude the second thing is if this independence is not just from society this independence is not just from what is happening in <coughs> in and around him but this is also a period where he is in one sense um, say declaring his independence from ideas that have been given so far that have been propagated so far so that our ideas of economy our ideas of ma- uh money that we are speaking of these are things probably that mm, thoreau is not really accepting so that when he comes up with a chapter title such as economy he is not necessarily mm, coming up with this idea of economy from the same perspective that we do when we think of economy we are thinking of budget we are thinking of money we are thinking of financial matters probably for uh, for 
thorough economy means something slightly different and it comes through economy for thorough is not just about money is not just about finances rather it's about economizing in every single manner every single aspect of life and it and in the chapter he goes on to speak just about it he says his economy is about your what are your needs what are your wants what are our desires and and in, and how we can actually economize on every front this is the thing that thoreau actually puts forth here this economizing that he comes up with he speaks about why uh, he starts with the question after speaking about um, the kind of silly advices that people keep giving he <clears throat> he moves on to the concept of work for thoreau uh, is not just um economy as uh, economizing as far as our um, expenses are concerned or economizing as far as our needs and wants are concerned but also economizing work why do we work what is the po reason for work why should we work these are the questions that thoreau starts with he says that most of us work without actually understanding the reason behind it there is a culture of work that is being propagated where man is forced to work day in and day out he is forced to believe that he needs to do certain activities just to be part of society thoreau questions the need or this uh, need for this kind of work for one thing secondly he also questions the need for people uh, to to follow a certain um, certain tradition of work without questioning it again since familiar right something similar to what emerson is saying now when this is what you are what thoreau is doing with work he speaks about how while people are working while people are are uh, are doing various activities the problems they face when they uh, push themselves to do more work because work in its own turn produces certain needs according to thoreau now what are these needs he says the more you work the more you have to eat first thing secondly the more you work the the clothes that you are wearing get worn out even more second thing so that you need more clothes so that your basic needs as per thoreau which is which are basically food clothing and shelter these are needs that we keep Uh, accumulating almost multiplying when we when we keep working unnecessarily while our basic needs are to provide for ourselves or to keep ourselves i mean well fed to keep ourselves well clothed to be keep ourselves well sheltered if these are this is what we are supposed to be doing we move away from actually uh, just doing enough work to provide for this and start pushing ourselves so that we keep harping on the amount of work we had done almost celebrating the amount of work we are doing most of us do not as per thorough love the work that we are doing but we do this work we we and we do it without questioning why we are doing it because it is it's a tradition that's one part of it now he says that all kinds of food that we have to eat and uh, thoreau speaks about the kind of food that people need he says what's the point of actually drinking coffee or tea or smoking or drinking alcohol or any of these things thoreau has a serious problem with any such act because they do not really feed you he even has a problem with meat because he says that if uh, the kind of activity if you limit the kind of activity you might even think about the kind of food that you are eating which just needs to provide you warmth food is there just to provide you warmth is what thoreau says is a fuel that we use so that we can actually do some work now if the work is minimal then the amount of fuel need is also minimal secondly we as we do not want if we stay in warmer climates as per thoreau we need to eat, we automatically eat lesser 
rather than actually staying in colder climates because the colder climates would force you to eat more because you need to produce more fuel to actually provide that warmth for your body the same thing goes with clothing the kind of clothes that you would wear again um, <coughs> wearing clothes that are sensible first and second rather than wearing clothes which which uh, you think of as as uh, as unnecessary luxury accumulating of clothes is again from the pawn fine and from there he moves on to what you do with your shelter so you can see that he's economizing work he's economizing food he's economizing clothes and he's he's not economizing expenses when he speaks about a shelter this is the first time that thoreau starts speaking about money he speaks about how he managed to build a log cabin for 28 and half dollars this um, of course a long time ago which would be close to something like 2000 dollars now but the 28 and half dollars for which, which he spends is all that he had spent because he himself built the log cabin in the woods he cleared a, a, a piece of land and he built he brought these logs along and he managed to build this cabin with his own hands and he feels that this is far better than actually um, paying rent for some house or a cabin that you are getting in the city here you have far more peace you have far more um, not just peace and freedom but it's also a place where you are um, where you are able to look at the world and and say that this staying in in a in a wood cabin and for a wood cabin that you completely own that you complete have complete rights to because you have built it on your own makes you uh, you can come up with something that you're really comfortable with rather than adjust to to a kind of house that you that you'd have in the city and he speaks about how economical it is in that sense that you're not really paying a rent and you are staying on your own secondly along with this uh, this money that he is speaking about here he also goes on to speak about money when he speaks about how he grew a farm and this farm while he grow how it it becomes economical because is able to mm, grow whatever he feels like is a vegetable farming that he is doing but along with growing his what he actually needed the kind of vegetables that he needed it also becomes useful for him it in a, as he is able to generate money out of it but what uh, thoreau is really speaking about here is not just the money that he had earned out of it or the money that he had saved by uh, built a log cabin but rather he is speaking about this how work can be really economical how a man can actually achieve every single of his needs on his own if he has time on his of his own where he is not really uh, working for someone else where he is not really being forced into the tradition of doing work without thinking about why he is doing this work he speaks about in in walden about others who who are forced uh, who like to keep horses carts and others and how to even manage them require even more work there is a lot more work that that it involves which he does not need to really uh, get into because he is mm, he is free from all those extra chores extra work because his possessions are few in other words he has economized as far as his possessions are concerned he has economized his the amount of work that he is going to put in what thoreau is speaking about is work smart rather than work hard this what thoreau comes up with he concludes the chapter um, after speaking about all of this about by speaking about how quite often uh, there are there is this culture of how people speak of poverty as if it uh, it gives one a moral and intellectual superiority that has been done in literature and thoreau 
frowns upon this. He is not really a fan of poverty. He is not a fan of mindless hard work. There is a difference between mindless hard work and uh, and believing that only hard work would uh, enable you to become rich or prosperous. He believes that to be prosperous, one has to work smart rather than one has to work hard or slog at whatever one is doing and this uh, and by working harder by working uh, by slogging all the time one of the problems that Thoreau sees with people who are doing this is they lose out time on them so that's the economy that he's speaking about at the same time he is also speaking about how poverty which has been made into a virtue and in um, the 18th and 19th centuries is not something that he actually agrees with. He completes the chapter by quoting from Thomas Carew's um, pretensions of poetry and speaks about how Carew had Carew had actually uh, spoken against this. The 18th century poet Thomas Carew that he is quoting here. The chapter that I want to uh, but. Uh, concludes with this with this particular poem and this con this poem then seems like an apt punctuation for for the whole chapter because it tells us exactly how Thoreau's mind was working it gives a reason as to why he had actually uh, gone on to build a log cabin in the woods the, and he quickly uh, some uh, gives us um, uh, a perspective as to what he is doing with um, why how he managed to actually get a house though he does not speak about the uh, emerson uh, but he speaks about a friend who had allowed him to stay in his uh, in, on his land and from there he moves on to speak about uh, speak pretty quickly about various kind of economies that we are pract have to practice now these economies might lead us to think that he is money-minded but the understanding here that we get that i mean he is freeing himself from earlier ways of thinking about money about economy per se is what becomes significant here the chapter that i want to deal with next is solitude now <coughs> what are the benefits um, of the social experiment that Thoreau uh, comes up with here is that it's solitude. He has lots of it. Now, solitude for Thoreau is something we have to distinguish from isolation. That's the first thing that Thoreau tries to do. He speaks about how people think that they are mm, fraternizing with others, that they have company, that they are with other people, that they are living in a world where um, where they um, where they understand what is happening, where they are uh, where where there is lots of company. Now, for thorough while there might be a lot of company, that's the often times when people feel that they are isolated. They might feel lonely even in a crowd, because just because people are speaking with you or just because you are meeting people on a daily basis it doesn't necessarily mean that they understand you or that you can really converse or communicate with them this is this becomes uh, how the basis for thoreau's un, uh, understanding i mean thoreau's questioning of how having so living in society does not necessarily mean that living a life where there is fraternity living is a life where there is there is actually a feeling of community now it's not so much that i mean he had moved away from community if he believes that he has moved away from this kind of isolation where there is this petty gossips that people are indulging in which is not really uh, which are not really neither interesting nor useful for for him he speaks about this isolation um that you have in society versus the solitude that you can gain when you move into nature when you move away from from a city into this um into the neck of woods as he had done now when he says that i mean you move into the woods and you have the solitude and one of the uh, benefits living away from the society uh, living away from society living in in the midst of nature is that he believes that 
he does not feel isolated now what what is the reason that seems pretty weird that when you have moved away from society when you are excluded when you are in one sense practicing what you might term social distancing again something that's extremely relevant in today's situation uh you, you don't feel isolated but thoreau says that you don't feel isolated because if you manage to actually commune with nature that becomes the uh, crucial here that you have to commune with nature this is the part of the elden where he speaks about how to commune with nature not just describing the various hmm, sounds and sights that he comes across uh, but he is also speaking about how while he is looking at uh, this birds animals vegetation even the pond one of the things that thoreau is struck by is that nature also has a voice and he then goes on to speak about mm, two people as he would term them that he meets there meets on the on the farm now these are not real people we keep assuming that they are real people when he speaks about them as an old man and an old maid that he meets there but these are allegorical references that he is coming up with allegorical references to one pan and the other mother nature as walter harding tells us now what what does he mean when he says that this is this is pan and mother nature pan is of course the greek god pan and we'll speak a, a bit more about pan when we move to the chapter on village but uh, mainly pan is also a god of anarchy in one sense but more than anarchy of freedom of independence of how you have to free your mind and the kind of freedom that which would almost lead to a sense of frenzy where in in the kind of activity is that you suddenly find that you are able to do this one aspect of it the second thing that he speaking about when he speaks about this old maid is this mother nature that mm, taro speaks of taro is speaking about how with mother nature you can commune and this commune uh, by communing with mother nature as well as the old man pan that he speaks of you're saying that you do have companions you have that freedom so you you can say that pan is your friend you can if you are able to look at the world around you and you can listen to what is happening around you and understand what is uh, whatever is happening you can say that you are communing with those old maid and she is becomes your friend as well you are fraternizing with two people who seem to understand you and who seem to actually you are able to fraternize better than the kind of world where you are forced to meet and greet people that you hardly know in in the kind of societies that we have constructed thoreau also speaks about individuals who were who if they are involved in their work would rather prefer solitude and i and want to be uh, to move away from society because he believes that for any work to get done if you are really interested in the work solitude is extremely necessary he speaks about a farmer on the farm where often he is working alone it's not as if he's always working with lots of other laborers lots of other farmers and uh, going on doing his work but for quite a long time he might be working alone and this work that he is doing that he is well uh, doing alone on the farm is something that makes the farmer not just someone who is working in solitude but also to get work get some work done he also speaks about how the scholar um, does his work silently and alone he might be stuck with his books whole day and for a farmer who sees a scholar and he thinks that the scholar is is isolated is someone who must be feeling lonely because he has nothing but his books in the same way the scholar might think of the farmer as someone who is isolated who is who might find himself alone on the farm but both the scholar and the farmer for thoreau are getting work done in isolation and in that sense they enjoying the fruits of solitude so and this becomes crucial for thoreau because he's he's showing how solitude does not necessarily mean um going 
mean that one doesn't challenge oneself or one does one becomes really lazy but rather some a place where people push themselves to do get more work done if people are interested in the work but they ought not to be slaves of work as he had already said in the chapter on economy the kind of uh, work that people ought to do the chapter that i want to look at next is the village no as i pointed out earlier uh, the chapter on village speaks about various activities that he sees in the village and when he goes to a nearby village but along with this he also speaks about how one can get so familiar with the various parts that one is able to find the way even in the dark now this again has to be read metaphorically thoreau speaks about how um, he he is able to find his way even at night without any light when he can actually move from his log cabin to the village when he can help people who have come to the woods and um who have lost their way or don't know how to go back and how to guide them these are experiences that he speaks of i suggest that i mean these these experiences that he is speaking about are have to be read as metaphorical experiences now why do we say this he's saying that people who are in the city who are living in the village who are living in society often believe that they are not just far more civilized than those the hermits who are living in in the forest in the jungles but secondly along with being far more civilized they believe that these people who are living in <coughs> in the in the woods uh, have less knowledge than they do do not really understand would find them would feel at a loss if they are actually asked to uh, move to the city for instance i mean even today when we think about the kind of gps and other things that the urban folk have and they keep speaking about how the gps would help them understand navigate various routes which those from the countryside would not be able to do uh, in the same way you are looking at people who believe that they are knowledgeable just because they have uh, better resources thoreau says that it's not so much resources that are needed to navigate and it's not just a path that he is speaking about here that that you can navigate even in the dark but even navigation through life you are navigating life you understand so that everything seems dark everything seems as if, as if you are ignorant of what is happening you the person who is believes in himself who is self reliant rather than uh, who relies on other resources is able to uh, make the optimum use of himself in such a manner that he can find a way out of this ignorance out of this darkness there is a person who is all the time looking at others for help looking for others to guide them looking for that kind of supervision looking for various resources which would enable them to find their ways in life these are people who would continuously get, uh, keep getting lost and he speaks about how even after he has helped this city folk uh, when they had lost their way in the woods they again lose their way that they keep roam rambling around roaming around in the woods uh, till till daylight now this as i just uh, i think is is a metaphorical under, uh, has to be read metaphorically about the kind of problems that are happening he also speaks about this from the perspective and then he he seems to jump to an idea that is completely alien to what he is writing about prior to that because he starts speaking about the government but there is a tenuous link if you look at it he believes as <coughs> um he as he speaks about even in civil disobedience about a certain kind of governance where the go where the government is not really enforcing its will upon the public but rather a government which does not govern at all that's what he actually says in his civil disobedience here too we he speaks about the same incident here though he does not go into detail he speaks about how one of the days uh, when he went to um, the village he was arrested for not paying poll tax 
Now, what is this poll tax? A poll tax is something that would say, uh, that is collected so that people um, are uh, are going to uh, the money that is needed to actually conduct an election. That's the poll tax that he's speaking about. Now, this poll tax as Thoreau is not really in favor of elections, is not really in favor of government. It seems almost silly to expect him to pay a poll tax, but and that's what Thoreau does. He does not really believe it till one of his friends, Emerson, in his obituary, speaks of one of the friends who actually paid the poll uh, obituary of um, Thoreau, speaks about how one of Thoreau's friends kept paying his poll tax till Thoreau uh, got really frustrated and finally gave up fighting against this poll tax. But this idea of, of what happens to Thoreau when he goes to the village and he is arrested is something that he refers to here, which is described in greater detail in civil disobedience, speaks about the necessity of a government which does not really enforce its rules on public, which does not coerce people to behave in a certain manner. That's the kind of government that Thoreau is advocating. Now, why is this significant? His when we look at what his speech says about, I mean, those who had actually lost their way when they had moved from the village or city to the woods and he starts speaking about the government, you can see that there is a link here where he's saying just like the government which forces people, which paves the way for people and tells them this is how you ought to behave or the, these are the rules that you ought to follow. Um, force people to start thinking about how to break these rules or move away from those rules because the more you coerce someone, more you start guiding someone, the more apt you are to actually fail. In the same way, uh, you need to remember that, I mean, this failure that happens because you have, um, you have tried to do, achieve something you have tried to achieve something as a government where you have been guiding people in the same manner where people have become less self-reliant so that they are more likely to fail. Just like the, the fishermen from the city who again lose their way, it is more likely that people will fail when they actually try, when the government tries to govern more. This is what um, Thoreau is trying to suggest in this, in the village. But the other thing that uh, I'm interested in when we speak about uh, this governance and we had spoken about how in the village we, we will again go back to our uh, the aspect of PAN. What happens uh, if we actually have a government which does not govern at all? In civil disobedience, of course, which was written prior to this, which is detailing the same experience, um, Thoreau speaks about how um, individuals have have to follow their own conscience and the conscience is far more significant than some kind of democratic government which says that so many people believe in a certain idea so that if the as this majoritarian government has decided on something everyone has to follow suit um, which for Thoreau is sincerely and the reason why he says this is he believes that man has a right to follow his conscience rather than follow the majority automatically. This is one part of it. However, a corollary to this, a problem that would automatically occur is that each individual has a conscience and as each individual has a conscience, there would be multiple ways in which people or the public can react to any given situation, suggesting a kind of anarchy. But isn't that what a pan stands for at one level? That kind of freedom. So that probably Thoreau is suggesting a kind of anarchy as preferable compared to the kind of governance. We'll get back to this at the end of uh, the discussion but this is a point that I want, uh, want to think seriously about as to why we are looking at um, this issue where we have a world, we have a world view where anarchy is uh, anarchy is supported in against the kind of governance that we find ourselves in. The next chapter that I want to look at is Baker Farm. Now, I find Baker Farm uh, quite significant in the whole book, the because Baker Farm also shows to us why 
thorough is coming up with a kind of world view or a uh, way which might not be practiced by others the others would not really think about it as something that they can easily follow the chapter starts begins with thorough going fishing this how it starts now thorough goes fishing and one of the things that happens is it starts raining and Thoreau seeks shelter in Baker Farm. Now, this is a ramshackle old place that he that he finds himself in. And this ram uh, in this ramshackle old place that he finds himself in, one thing that he immediately notices, this is a place that Thoreau had actually thought of um, <coughs> living in prior to actually uh, deciding on Walden. Baker Farm was a place that Thoreau had himself had thought of uh, habitating, but when he seeks shelter at Baker Farm, it is occupied by these Irish immigrants, John Field and family. Now, we don't know whether John Field is a pseudonym, his endowment that Thoreau had given him, but John Field and his family, Thoreau finds, are, are poor, but extremely hardworking and the first assumption that the reader has is this is a family that's desperately unlucky. That's one of the things that the reader feels when he's reading this for the first time because it's a house that they have rented this this Baker farm that the John Fields are living in is rented uh, and the uh, it leak the roof leaks in this this particular house the roof is leaking so the lady of the house seems to be actually carrying a mop all the time and then this is a mm, place where where they find that even the pails are the pail is broken so that they can't really get water from the well and uh, the kind of world that they are living in they seem to be struck by lots of difficulties the, and most of them say, uh, seem to suggest that they, that the kind of life that they are leading is extremely and extremely unlucky and hard one. But Thoreau does not think that they are unlucky. It's something that he believes that they had actually made their own luck. Because he tries to convey to field and family that I mean, they had unnecessarily moved to America. That's the first thing that Thoreau tries to tell them. And the reason why he says that is because Field and family say that they had actually moved to America because in America they can get various things such as coffee, tea, sugar and other things. For Thoreau, all these are unnecessary luxuries as he had already spoken about in economy. He says that these are unnecessary luxuries. These are the kind of clothes that you are wearing. And John uh, is for Thoreau again uh, that field and family are wearing is again for thorough something that he is not really comfortable with thirdly he says that i mean field is renting a house when he could have as well built one of his own which i'm not really sure is all that uh, possible considering he might not have a friend who is as accommodating as emerson that thorough had but secondly uh, he could have uh, built a, his own house or but he could have easily repaired or bought a new pail so that they could actually drink proper water. The, that's one part of it. But along with uh, the kind of problems that Field and family were facing because of the luxuries that they are used to such as coffee and tea, is also a kind of world where uh, the kind of work that Field is doing that Thoreau has a problem with. Thoreau has a problem with the kind of work that um, that Field is doing and field, what Field is doing is Field is bogging. The kind of work which would require him to keep changing his shoes regularly, which was of course uh, something as Thoreau had spoken about in, in economy, in his chapter on economy, is, some, is, is something which he believes, I mean, the kind of work that you do, even irrespective of whether you want to work hard or not, the kind of work that you do, first and foremost, that you have to love it. Secondly, this has to be the kind of work which does not incur expenses, more expenses than is than are necessary. And field and family were coming up with work that would require more expenses because, because of a broken pail, they had to actually boil the water. Because of working, um, of bogging, the kind of occupation that Field has chosen, they had to keep changing his shoes. Because of 
their addiction to luxury such as coffee and tea they had to actually earn more at the end of this uh, of the chapter uh, john field accompanies thoro as they go fishing and thoro finds that even, even the baits that are used by john field are silly he has no idea as to and again we have to read this metaphorically he is saying that field when he comes up with these baits for this fish um uh, is finds that he is extremely unlucky that he does not manage to catch any fish that's one part of what uh field does but then field believes that it's because of where he is sitting um when they are going on the boat where they are sitting that that he is not able to catch the fish so thoro and field exchange places and even after exchanging exchanging their places he finds that um, field does not catch any fish so what thoro is saying here is that it's not so much luck or hard work or um or the amount of hard work which automatically should pay but rather it's about working smart the kind of baits that you need to use you can't keep changing your locality whether from whether you are in ireland or whether you are in america for thoro does not really make much of a difference unless you manage to change the way you view the world the change the kind of perspectives that bring that you bring to this world that's the thing that thoro is trying to suggest here now the point or the problem that we have with baker farm and most critics have, uh, have condemned thoro mainly on the basis of this chapter they say that thoro comes across as unfeeling unkind that he is against immigrants that he does not understand the concerns the problems of the immigrants that he does not um he is not compassionate he is not transcendentalist these are some of the problems that critics have have with and critics have many problems let us just enumerate them um they speak about how thoro had spoken about the necessity of government in village in in the chapter on the village which becomes equally problematic for them because uh, <coughs> they believe that um the uh, any society without a government would quickly uh, disintegrate the, they speak about the kind of um, even literary structure that uh thoro uses in solitude because they start speaking about the pathetic fallacies that became a part of the chapter on solitude where he speaks about uh, how the pine needles were sympathetic there's a term that this there's a phrase that thoro uses when in his chapter and again critics had a problem with that critics also had a problem with the seeming inconsistency in the first chapter economy and how materialistic thoro is while he is supposed to be leading a him its life now these are some of the complaints that people have with uh, with thoro uh, not just this unkind nature or unfeeling nature in baker farm that they are speaking about let us look at and in some of the difficulties people um, that even normal readers have with thoro we have spoken about the kind of criticism that uh, various persons have come up with but along with it if you look at i mean some of the difficulties that in normal that most readers most of us would find when we read thoro is that one mm, is extremely verbose some of the sentences are so long with lots of commas so that you are you often lose track of what thoro is trying to say in the sentences but it's not just uh, that the book is verbose and there are these long sentences that you would find here but uh, he, there are these regular references to um confucius for one there are these quotations from confucius there are quotations from various poets such as thomas carroll that you find and then you have this metaphors that mm, a metaphorical language that thoro keeps using and then there is there are these allegories that he <coughs> that he uses further now, finally there are these myths he there is reference to hercules and pan and other greek myths that he makes a part of well then he also uses indian myths such as indra he brings in the tale of indra as part of um 
this well done and one of the complaints that critics have is he's showing off that he's showing off his knowledge he's showing off he's someone who is self-absorbed someone who is self-centered a selfish individual who's not just unfeeling but someone who is a misanthrope this is a regular criticism that you come across when you're reading Thoreau and furthermore he's also speak as if, uh, spoken of as if his anti-civilization as if he is almost uh, nihilist, an anti-capitalist, a Marxist, an anarchist, and finally, as someone who is who is a hypocrite, who who is actually coming up with a bunch of lies. These are the various criticisms that are levied against um, Thoreau. A more recent one is that Thoreau is spoken of as someone who speaks to the wildest desires that humans have and that's why he's so popular we'll get back uh, to this uh, whether it makes sense when we speak then when we say that i mean he's he's he is in one sense appealing to our wildest desires but what actually the valden shows remember right at the very beginning we have spoken about how it is in one sense um, a dramatization that is being done. I mean, the, the events are mm, co condensed to a point where you are looking at, uh, at events which had actually taken over two years, two months and two years. We are looking at them as if they had taken place over, what, uh, just a year. That's one of the things that we are um, we have to remember when we are reading the elders. So that while it seems a bit dramatic, it's not that Thoreau is intentionally lying to the reader. These are not events that had happened exactly, but to enable the reader to read it in a way so that it forms a narrative. It becomes a proper narrative structure that you can give it. That's one part of it. Secondly, one of the main problems that readers and critics have with Thoreau when they speak of him not just as a hypocrite but as self-absorbed and so on is we come up with certain expectations regarding what Thoreau ought to do and what Walden ought to be. Now, what do we mean by that? We, th we read the story of so social um, of a person who is living in solitude and isolation, who has moved away from society, who is living in the woods, and we expect someone who is living a hermit existence, we automatically believe that he is anti-modernity. Thoreau is not against modernity. In fact, he speaks about the sound of trains, the train cars that he can hear in the distance. And while he speaks about the train cars in the distance, one of the things that Thoreau does is he compares this and says that after a point, all these sounds, whether these are train cars or whether these are birds chirping or whether it's uh, the sound of the pond that he that he gets from the pond, all these sounds for thorough are one and the same. There is not really much of a difference, he says. Once there is that kind of distance from the sound, and if you are listening to them over a period of time, they all of them sound the same. In that sense, he's not really against railway railways or against modernity. Furthermore, I mean, as Emerson tells us in his as Emerson writes in his obituary for Thoreau, Thoreau died very young at, at the age of 44. Uh, one of the things that Emerson says is how Thoreau had once mm, argued with a university to allow him to actually uh, borrow books. Now, Thoreau's argument was quite simple that while the university allowed people from the university or those who were living in the village, in the, in the university town where to borrow books, they did not allow others to borrow books. Thoreau's argument was that due to the railways, distances are a matter of perspective. The understanding of distance, the understanding of time has changed considerably and the university has to take into account that while for some, I mean in an earlier period, uh, it could only actually allow people who could walk uh, a certain distance or who could uh, to borrow books from the library. Now they can actually take a train, come to the university, borrow books and they can go back on the same day. So 
it there shouldn't be a problem now what this argument actually tells us is how much in favor of railways first and foremost that thorough is in other words how much in favor of modernity how uh, is not that he was against modernity that he had gone away into the jungles gone away to live in the woods um one of the things that people say these days as um, that we see here as ron charles had recently written he says that the reason why thoreau had actually gone into the woods is something altogether different he speaks about how thoreau had moved to the woods moved to into the jungle as ron charles refers to it and says that this was mainly to come to terms with various tragedies in his whole life uh, at that point and the tragedies that charles is speaking about is thoreau's elder brother passed away a few years prior to this just be prior to thoreau moving to this um, to walden in 1847 now in 1845 now this one part of what was happening but it was also the time when um, who is this emerson's um emerson's youngest child uh, got uh, was killed now this was a little boy that thoreau had played with thoreau had um had played with because thoreau was working as a handyman in emerson's household so this emerson child was someone that he was really close to he was fraternizing with him now this fraternizing with emerson's child as well as his brother these are two tragedies that thoreau was trying to come to terms with when he moved to to the woods that's what charles says irrespective of whether we agree with charles the uh, idea of what thoreau was trying to do one thing that we have to remember is thoreau is not trying to uh, come up with a way of living in, in a society where he is against civilization or against society rather he was trying to create a kind of world a kind of and uh, um, he is trying to prove to himself that it is possible to live um, away from society that's one thing that he was trying to do but secondly far more importantly what he was trying to do is he showing that uh, in walden how one moves from being self reliant to self realization now what does this mean now self reliance to self realization that's the pro what you actually find in 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 the world the um, thoro starts with actually being uh, relying on himself understanding what he is doing why he is doing certain things and and being completely independent not just in doing things but also i mean thinking about things he is being independent he is not allowing others to tell him as to how he ought to do things something that we have to remember so he is not judging himself by <coughs> by the kind of ideas that are propagated by others by the kind of culture that is put forth he is not doing anything of the sort rather he is trying to do something where he is completely independent in mind as well as in body in other words he's doing what emerson had preached he has become the man thinking that's one of the things that uh, thoreau is doing here but along with being man thinking here he is the the thinking man or in the woods who can actually lead a life on his own he is also someone who is um, who while he is doing all these activities he is Uh, not really fighting against society, but rather what society has turned into. He is celebrating what you term as the self. In that sense, um, Thoreau has is going back to a world, to this romantic notions of the self, where it is possible for the self or for an individual to become godlike. He speaks about this that how an individual can become akin to God. Now, what do we mean when we say individual akin to God? It's not such a such a novel term. If you remember, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. That's what Frankenstein is trying to do. Frankenstein is trying to actually emulate God. 
to do something that God has done to create human beings. In the same way, Thoreau is saying is also in one sense trying to become like God, trying to say that I mean how an individual or the realization of the self where the optimum self where you're completely free, where you're completely free from other others thoughts and uh, how people have um, tried to co uh, how how people think or how the government actually forces rules from if we free ourselves from these how a man becomes almost godlike that's what um, Thoreau is doing Thoreau is also speaking about this individualism which uh, which is a, a major part of American philosophy where we look at uh, John Dewey's ideas of individualism and you can see how Thoreau is doing something really similar. But along with this romantic notions of the self, Thoreau is marrying these ideas with what you term as Victorian or 19th century pragmatism. Now what is this Victorian or 19th century pragmatism that we are speaking about? How practical you can be how you can actually behave in a practical manner for one thing and this practicality or this pragmatism that he is that Thoreau brings to this uh, realization of the romantic self makes uh, not for an uneasy compromise rather it creates an individual who is trying to do something heroic it's a different matter altogether that what Thoreau does is not exactly what the readers or the critics or the world expects because the expectations of the world, expectations of the reader is for someone who have who should turn their back, back upon society and show that it is possible to live without society. Thoreau, while he is doing all this, is also showing that how much do we need society is what Thoreau is more interested in rather than saying that we do not need society at all. How much of society do we need? Which becomes an, a key point at this particular juncture, at this particular point of time when we are looking at the world and we are thinking about how often should we meet people once uh, there's no longer a quarantine, there's no longer a lockdown or something. So the questions uh, that we need to ask ourselves is to how much of uh, whether social gatherings are necessary, how much of fraternizing is necessary. These are questions that in 2020 we are asking ourselves. Thoreau is asking in, in the mid-19th century. He is not saying that we don't need society, please. Uh, something that we need to keep remembering. Because well done is a revolutionary experiment. But while it's a revolutionary experiment that Thoreau comes up with, it's not an experiment to prove that civilization or modernity or society is irrelevant. Rather, the way uh, people have become slaves to a certain culture, to a certain tradition is what Thoreau is trying to challenge. It speaks about how to make one's life purposeful. It speaks about how Goal shouldn't be something that's completely external as if someone else, you, you are living your life as per someone else's goal so that it becomes something like a motivational work. You have to come up with your own goals and the goals that you create uh, for yourself have not only have to be pragmatic but it does not, should not necessarily enslave you to any kind of work or any kind of activity. It's also about how uh, you lead something like a complete life. Complete life rather than, I mean, push yourselves to live in a, in a certain manner because you are trying to work or do things which others believe are worth doing. Just like when we are discussing Emerson, we speak about how man has allowed himself to be, to become a part rather than a whole. Thoreau is doing something similar where he speaks about how we need to and what we need to do to get a holistic understanding of ourselves. The impact uh, then uh, of whatever Thoreau has done here is immense of course, naturally. Um, not just in American literature but worldwide. Uh, we speak about of course um, Huck, um, Twain's Huck who probably would not have been possible without a story, without uh, Thoreau's experience because um, 
you can see how Huck actually is, is thinking about his own conscience, how he goes against what society is doing, how there are these long periods on the raft that Leslie Fiedler, for instance, writes about where uh, Huck, when he finds himself on the raft, away from society, away from civilization, the only kind of fraternity that he can have is with that of a black man. Um, we are not being racist, but for someone in the 19th century where a white boy has to fraternize with a, with a black man with whom they would term as just slaves who are almost viewed as um, subhuman uh, in the 19th century, that kind of world, in that kind of world for Huck to do whatever is do, uh, he does and for Twain to create such a character would not have been possible probably without Thoreau speaking about what exactly we mean when we say that we need society, what exactly we mean when we say that uh, we think far deeper when we are in solitude because it not just tells us more about the world that we find ourselves in, we not only think about the world that uh, we are seeing around us when we are in solitude but the memories that we carry with us as in the chapter on solitude would tell us the memories that we carry with us would make us revisit our own actions revisit our own experiences so that it gives us a better understanding of the kind of um, person that we ought to be now that's what Walden is doing now this solitude will quickly conclude. Now, now this, uh, this work of Thoreau, when he's speaking about this and the influence that he has, right from Mark Twain to say John Updike in, in American literature, but it's not just writers that he had influenced. He had influenced Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. He had influenced. Mm, uh, <coughs> national leaders worldwide such as Gandhi, Mandela and others. Now, one of the things that Thoreau's idea here is this speaking about a person in isolation is not something that's completely strange to a reader of English literature. Uh, it is something that in the 18th century, uh, those who are readers of 18th century fiction would have come across when they read Robinson Crusoe. Now, why do we say this? Thoreau's Walden well is in one sense a response to Robinson Crusoe, Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. Now, Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, we have to remember, in the 19th century was immensely popular. In fact, it was treated almost like a Bible, like the Bible, because if you, if you read Wilkie Collins' Moonstone, one of the things that happens in the novel is you have a character, a butler character, Butteridge, who is shown referring to Robinson Crusoe as if it's a Bible. He opens the book by chance, uh, books, uh, this novel, Robinson Crusoe, and while he flips open this book, he looks at passages to tell him what, um, how he's supposed to act on any given day. Now, why is that similar to the Bible? Even these days, we do get um, on our apps, on our mobile apps, something like one verse from the Bible, one verse from the Gita or the Quran or whatever. These are random verses that you can actually subscribe to. In the same way, people used to go for these random verses by flipping open a Bible. And while they flipped open the Bible and looked at these random verses so that they would guide them into so and figure out how they were supposed to act on any given day for advice, for, for guidance, they trusted the Bible. In the same way, they trusted Robinson Crusoe. So Robinson Crusoe was an extremely... Um, significant text in the 18th in the 19th century not just the 18th century but the 19th century when Thoreau was writing Walden and furthermore Thoreau and Emerson um, Emerson writes about a conversation that he had with Thoreau where he speaks about uh, how exciting it would be to write a book such as Robinson Crusoe which everyone would read Thoreau was not really convinced because he did not believe the stories with what the world actually needs, but rather in examples that they needed. That's what he was thinking of. Now, 
Thoreau goes on to do in well done what Defoe does not do in Robinson Crusoe. Now, what does Defoe does not do? Defoe speaks about uh, Crusoe as someone who relies on himself, who harks back to his experiences from civilization, who tries to lead a civilized life in on this uninhabited island in isolation, in this enforced isolation, enforced solitude in the case of Robinson Crusoe. How he tries to retain his sanity, how to how he tries to retain his civilization. And the first chance that he gets, he actually leaves this island and goes off. That's what Defoe speaks of. There is a bit of self, um, of, you know, while it speaks about self-reliance, it's more to do with, as Martin Green would tell us, about how uh, the colonizer was trying to uh, come to terms with new territories to what they term as wilderness that they find themselves in. Thoreau, on the other hand, in his own experience uh, in, in Walden, is not so much as trying to colonize the land that he, that he finds himself in or draw or just retain his civilization or retain his... Mm, sanity while he is living in the woods. That's not what Thoreau's under, uh, Thoreau is doing. Thoreau goes further and he is trying to um, come to an understanding of himself, come to an understanding of what is happening in the world around him. How man by nature ha is hampered by the kind of culture that he has created for himself, the kind of civilization that he has created for himself. That's what Thoreau finds. And in that sense, it has a far-reaching effect compared to Crusoe. In that sense, uh, Walden, as the uh, title is extremely apt. Walden, the word comes from, I mean, of course, where uh, it's based on Walden Pond, we might say, but Along with Walden Pond, one of the things that we need to remember is Walden comes from old English word to wield, to control, to determine, to govern. Now, who is the one who is governing here? Who is the one who is determining you? It, the text in that sense is about figuring out who is governing you, who is determining your actions. Is it yourself? Are, are you allowing the society to do it? In Thoreau's case, he chose that he is going to govern himself. He is going to allow him his own self to decide what he wants to do. So that while it might come across as self-absorbed, a text that is self-absorbed or self-centered, you have to remember it is about the self. It's not because uh, the criticism that I said that we'll again get back to later where we said that it is not a will a celebration or um, of all that is willful or it appeals to us because um, it appeals to what is wild in us. Remember, one of the criticisms that uh, that is levied against um, Thoros Walden is this is a book that would appeal to those who are adolescents who are or whose uh, adolescent in mind for the simple reason it talks about not being disciplined it talks about how you do not allow yourself to to succumb to authority. You do not mm, allow others to tell you what you're supposed to do. It talks about how you uh, you are doing whatever pleases you. It talks about how work has to be something like play. But while we say that this is not about uh, that kind of willful living that um, that it seems to suggest it also well it might not really be practical in the kind of world that we find ourselves in as in Baker farm the john fields find but it's also a kind of world where we need to start seriously thinking about why we are working what we are working for and why we are living in the first place or are we actually allowing the kind of society or the kind of civilization that we are part of to decide for us how our lives are going to be governed. This, I think, is the key takeaway from, from Thoreau's Walden, that we need to start thinking about who is governing us or what is governing us. Thank you. Um, 
I'll keep this open for the next few minutes. Let's see if we have any questions. We have questions or comments. I'll wait for your questions for a few minutes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, better colleague Dantan for this. Mm. Should I wait for questions any longer or, or shall I take, um, answer it in the comment section as in when I see them? I'll wait for a couple of minutes. Let's see what happens. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions here. Is the use of I universal? Isn't writer's movement towards spirituality a kind of escapist move? Mm, thank you. First and foremost, <coughs> the I is subjective, not necessarily universal here. The way Thoreau used it in the well in Walden. But remember, when Thoreau is speaking of I having done this, it might come across as egoistic that he is speaking about what he is doing, what he had achieved and what he had done, but thus where we are speaking about self-realization. If we speak about I as universal and I as something where you are identifying with Thoreau, then you are saying that you are also achieving all the things that Thoreau is, is doing here, there is a sense of self-delusion, I think, that goes on with this self-delusion because we haven't really turned our back on so on various restraints the society has imposed on us whether how we view work how we view society how we view fraternity how we view community each of these is is in uh, does not necessarily mean that we have actually achieved that the same kind of eye or we can actually identify with the eye of thorough so while Thoreau 
when he uses I is not necessarily universal it's extremely subjective it might seem as if when we are when we read um, uh, well done as if he is extremely egoistic but that's what we spoke about when he said that while he comes across as self-absorbed there's a necessity it is necessary to a certain extent to be self-absorbed to for self-actualization for self-realization to happen and that's what Thoreau's uh, Walden is about. Your second question where you speak about this uh, movement as spirituality as a kind of escapism. Now, that's far more interesting. Spirituality as you, as we often understand it, is not in contrast to the physicality. It's not as if you are looking at the world as if there are these two spheres. Uh, one ephemeral, the other cor corporeal. One spiritual, the other physical. And you're saying that if you are interested in the spiritual, that you have forgotten um, the physical world or you have turned your back on the physical world. Not really. Thoreau speaks about how it is, it's not so much about becoming spiritual and when we say being godlike it's not that you're you're following a particular kind of religion or you're worshiping but rather first and foremost not treating work as worship a concept which is popularized in your 19th century <coughs> i'll get get to that sir, in a minute now uh, so it's not so much that you are looking at whatever is happening in in the 19th century and saying that uh, where people were speaking about work as worship Thoreau goes against this notion of work as worship so that the spirituality that you are confusing with is not so much that he is speaking about how you have to th think about the other world or about moksha or something rather he's speaking about how you feel comfortable in the present world that you are satisfied with your own whatever you are doing in the present world so it's very much about the here and now rather than about some kind of ephemeral tomorrow that is not that Thoreau is speaking so that it's not escapist at all so that even when he goes to the woods even when he is living away from society it's not escaping of so from society that he is coming up with it's not as if he had gone into hiding, remember? But rather as someone who is escaping from certain restraints that we have ourselves imposed on ourselves. Not so much as escaping as challenging the restraints that are placed on us. Does it um, help you? The next question is, what is my personal impression of Thoreau? Now, Thoreau is, uh, is something that Walden is something is a text that I actually read when I was really really young in my primary school days uh, that might come as a surprise but my eldest sister had Walden uh, prescribed for her in every tradition and then we got an average of one and one cent but I uh, found it extremely difficult to read naturally because of the sentences, the kind of sentence structures that I found in the book. And for that reason, I kept reading it again and again. The, the, one of the reasons, of course, was because there weren't uh, many books. I did not really possess many books at that time. So I used to go back to the same book again and again. So that without knowing it, um, some of the things that Thoreau speaks of about liking whatever you do, about a work that you do which you actually like rather than doing something because people ask you to do it is something that I that had always resonated with me um, now when I think back one of the things that I realized it right from school days the problem that I had with my teachers is because uh, I would not like to do what they asked me to do now <laughs> Which is which is really kind of silly to in a discipline structure so thorough in that sense is someone while um, as I grew older I realized is someone impractical it's not really practical to follow thorough that is not really possible to follow thorough but my personal impression of thorough is someone that uh, who I consider as a hero who I consider as someone in the present society and the present world that we need to 
start thinking about far more seriously not just because of the uh, of lockdown that we find us uh, that we see uh, that we are that we are experiencing but mainly because he makes us um, think about the world from a perspective where we are freeing our minds and that someone had actually achieved this Emerson too speaks about man thinking about someone about people actually freeing their minds and leading that that kind of life but Thoreau when he does this he is actually practicing it. it is highly difficult for all of us for any of us to actually completely free ourselves from the kind uh, of ideas that are um, that we um, that, that are given to us through culture, through tradition, to what others have told us. So, Thoreau, I find, makes one our life more perfect. Are you reading Thoreau and looking at what he does makes our life more purposeful, as I was saying uh, even earlier. It makes our life purposeful because we start thinking about how can we govern ourselves, how can we govern our needs, what are our needs? What are our wants? What, do we really need what we think we need? becomes a question that I think that we should learn from Thoreau. And for in this particular period, it becomes even more significant because again and again, we come across these uh, youngsters who say that they, they haven't, um, due to the lockdown, done something that they ought to do or are or, or regretting because they can't really find certain things. So my personal impression of Thoreau is, is someone who's heroic, someone is impossible to actually emulate but at the same time someone who we can view, look up to and try to at least think about when we are do, going about doing our work so that we do not really become comp mechanical in whatever activity that we are doing. See if we can love it because if we love the work that we are doing, we'll automatically do it far better than uh, doing it just as a core that we are forced to do. Mm. Any other questions? Any other questions, any other issues? Any problems, doubts? Anything else that I need to clarify or else? Okay, if there are any other questions, well, I'll answer in the comment section because I think um, that's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'll conclude the, the lecture and once again, I thank um, Tarunda and Better College for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir, Anand, sir. It, it was really great seeing you here, actually. Uh, I didn't expect this. Thank you very much. Anand Mohanand, Professor Anand Mohanand was my supervisor. Um, that I conclude this lecture.